This is the fireworks session. Uh, we've got um, some exciting, yes, exactly. We've got three Fortune 500 companies, the leaders here uh, of, um, you know, going through tremendous change. I mean, remarkable disruption, not just from what customers are looking for, but from a lot of competition, regulatory change, in some cases, uh, merger change, um, and they're, all, they all have to reinvent themselves and their companies and their cultures. John, I want to talk first about, just get this straight, your merger with uh, Time Warner is done, right, at and The deal is closed. The deal is closed. The government hasn't given up yet. Right, they don't know. They don't know that it's no, closed. No, they know. They're well aware. Okay. They're well aware. But they're, they're fighting anyway. It's their last gasp. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we don't spend a lot of energy right now. We're, we're focused on integration. I, that's a... Um, a lawyer activity at this point on the appeal process, so uh, we're moving ahead with making it work. Isn't it nice when you just say that's a lawyer activity and you don't have to think about it? Yeah. Uh, no, not really. <laughs> I love it when, more when things are marketing or sales-related activities rather than lawyer activities. They're unfortunately necessary. But I just I want to follow up though on this. What you had already gone through uh, a, a massive a realization that your industry itself was going through this tremendous change. You were going from a, a world of switching uh, networks and fiber optic cables to something very, very different. And the workers, hundreds of you were one of the largest employers in the world, you had to retrain them as much as you had to re uh, change the equipment. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, um, well, first of all, they're you know, Chinese proverb, may you live in interesting times. I tell our team that uh, it's awesome when you look at your primary competitors and you have a different strategy and one of you is dead wrong. Right. Like that is such an awesome place to be where you've got to now go out and execute. And if that doesn't motivate you to get up and make it happen, um, nothing will. But, but to your point, in order to get ready for that future, um, we, we have to reskill, you know, quantities of, of employees that are, um, depending on timing and how you look at it, it's 100,000 or so people. And you can't just say, well, let's just change our hiring model and go get them. Right. The numbers are too big. So we're, we, you know, we're, we're in a position of having to really retrain people. And Kathy, so you're also going through a tremendous uh, transformation in your, uh, in your competitive landscape. Um, I saw a report that looked at business expense uh, reports, and one of them was mine, I'm sure, and it looked at you know, what share of them um, were using Ubers and Lyfts versus rental cars. And I was shocked that Uber and Lyft made up about 65% of that market, according to this study, leaving the rest mostly for the rental car industry. That's completely different than it was, say, six years ago. Well, that, my guess is Uber and Lyft did that study. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, in, in all seriousness, um, if you look at what our business comes from, what the rental mm. car business comes from, uh, the bulk of it is five-day rentals for uh -huh. between three and 500 miles. Yeah. Um, so only about 10% of our business was the short-term rentals that you're talking about. So what probably, um, where that probably came from was taxis and limos. Uh -huh. And in fact, what we're seeing, so we are, you know, we're a huge um, part of the corporate environment. And, you know, I, I think a lot of our, our brand excellence comes from how we serve the corporate um, industry. And one of the things we found now with our partners is they're asking us to help them drive more towards rental cars because the Lyft and Uber bills are right. astronomical. Um, and if you think you can rent a car for $40 a day, or you can take three or four trips on an Uber Lyft and it's 150, um, they've started to see that that's a bit of an issue. Do you worry about the car sharing uh, kind of new platforms like a Toro or things like that? Well, you know, I do think, you know, there, look, consumers have various needs. Um, and for some consumers, it's okay to share somebody else's car for a day. Right. And it's going to be convenient. So you also have to get to that car. Um, right. And there has to be that person available and it has to be safe. Um, so there's a lot of ifs. And I think, you know, one of the most valuable things about the company that, you know, I'm privileged to be running is its brand. And as I'm looking at John's socks, and I can't yeah. resist. They're branded. This. They're yeah, branded with the AT&T logo, by yeah. the way. And, um, and just for the record, I don't share my 
car with even my spouse. Or, or your socks. <laughs> or your socks, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I, I think that the challenge is, um, you know, my favorite example is um, last year there was a solar eclipse. And we made national news um, because we actually had to call people up in certain places. Um, our reservation system hadn't built into it the fact that a once in a hundred year solar eclipse was happening, and we allowed it to overbook. And so we had to call people up and say, you know, sorry, we can't rent a car. And it caused a dramatic, you know, outrage all over the country because so many people were renting cars to go to these special places to watch the solar eclipse. Due to planetary realignment, we have to cancel your reservation? Is that what you said? <laughs> Pretty yeah. much, yes. Yeah. So actually, though, you know, one of the things we did do is we spent a lot of money to again to protect our brand and moved a lot of cars um, into locations to make sure we could fill as much of that demand as possible. So there's needs for there's needs for all of these different right. transportation areas. So um, Dirk, you're not spared from this planetary realignment question, which is that the food industry, the snack food industry, has changed dramatically. We've written in Fortune about the war on big food. Uh, shoppers have changed their taste suddenly, and they're avoiding the middle aisles and going to the you know the fresh food and other sort of healthy offerings on the perimeter. Um, that is a direct shot to a huge part of your business. Um, in addition to that, now you're also competing with different sellers of those foods. So you've got the Amazons putting price pressure on a lot of this stuff, and Walmart, a big, you know, carries a lot of your products, is, is also putting price pressure. So you're getting changed from a lot of places now, too. Yeah, um, I would say for food in general, that is, that is true. Um, we are 85% of our product range is snacking mm -hmm. in uh, over 160 countries. So snacking is, is a little bit different. Uh, millennials on average eat about seven times a day. Mm. They don't think in, 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 uh, <laughs> in big meals anymore. Uh, they're very... Wait, can we? Yeah. Wait, millennials eat about seven times a day? They graze throughout the they day. They graze. <laughs> yes, yes. We have a grazing, a new population and, of grazing. And so snacking is yeah. going up. People live much more outdoors. And, and longer commutes and so on. Snacking is a good place to be in food. Um, so as I compare the snacking market, which we play in, and we're the biggest in the world in that, that, that is not as affected by the different trends mm -hmm. as you were uh, mentioning. But yes, there is big change going on, that's uh, no doubt. So the reason I bring all this up is that you're all, I wanted to beat you all up first and then I can ask nice questions, but, but the, the idea is you're all going through really, in some cases, existential change or, or massive disruptive change in your industries. And yet, at the same time, you all have to come in and, and change the cultures to uh, anticipate that change, to, to get your own teams, um, you know, going to meet all of this, you know, different kind of a landscape. And so, you know, I wanted to talk about how you go about and do that. And Kathy, you know, at, at Hertz, how do you, how do you go about you know, changing that, you're, kind of, you're two years into this job, almost 21 months into this new job. How do you, how do you go and change the culture? Well, I, I think, you know, a turn, the fascinating thing about a turnaround is it's a great call to action, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, you have a burning platform. Um, you have something to get people excited about. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what we've done is step back and said, instead of just fixing things for today, to embrace what you talked about, ride sharing, autonomy, mm -hmm. um, car sharing, and say, okay, what is, you know, what's our place in the future? Um, so as I think people can get excited about what they're doing today if it's hard work, if it's going to continue to give them a future and a career, mm -hmm. and that career and future is more exciting maybe than what they have today. And so when you look at our role in all of that, um, we're very unique, uh, the rental car industry, in that we're the only guys out there that actually own the cars. Mm. So Uber and Lyft, um, they don't own the cars. Um, the OEMs don't own the cars. Um, dealers sell cars to consumers. The OEMs sell cars to the dealers. Mm. And Uber and Lyft drivers drive around the cars for Uber and Lyft. So if you look out into the future and envision a world of aut autonomous vehicles, and forget about all of the legal issues and everything else that will complicate that, but let's say they're there. 
Um, there's nobody else out there that manages a million car fleets except rental car companies. And Hertz is unique in, in that we also own a large corporate fleet management company. So we manage large corporate fleets for companies like Coca-Cola, pharmaceuticals, and then repairing the rails and energy companies. And so we have experience in not just managing our own fleet out to consumers. So imagine a world of autonomy, who's going to do that and who has a reservation and a rental system, who has people to clean the cars. There's a great article, if you want to read it, about this called Robots Don't Clean Up Vomit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and trust me, if you've got these cars in colleges, that is going to be something your employees are going to have to do. You know, as the editor of Fortune, I feel like I've missed uh, a key article. That there. is a key article. <laughs> uh, but we, say, yeah. we have, you know, if you go in the United States, we are a half an hour away from everybody in the United States 93% of the time. So we also have places to put all these cars while we maintain them and take care of them. So that's what we get people excited so about. So you get, so, and, and you see that as a strength, not as a, as having the, the ownership of these vehicles. There are other business models out there that says, we don't want to own anything. We want to be all OPEX, not CAPEX. We want to just, you know, uh, make other people lay out the money for this stuff. But you well, we could also manage large fleets. Right. So we can own them and manage them and manage directly them. out right. to the consumer if we want to. And, you know, think about it. Hertz is a very highly regarded, preferred brand in the auto industry. So, you know, again, we're trusted. Right. So if there's somebody managing an autonomous fleet out to you, I think we're a trusted brand around that. So, Dirk, I w want to just quickly, you, you, we talked about changing cultures, and one of the things that you and I talked about was that you've actually incentivized. You've got about 26% of your, your businesses in North America. The rest is in local markets around the world. For to have To meet the changing landscape, you've got to... You have to really empower your local authorities, and you've actually changed your incentive structure on this. Yes, yes. Um, well, we have to adapt to the new uh, world of food that you were talking about, and right. uh, um, that means that we need to become more consumer-focused than ever before. And, and I think in food, we've forgotten that a little bit in the last uh, 10 years or so, and we're very focused on margins and so on. So what we need to do is understand that new consumer you were talking about much better and since we work in many countries around the world, um, it's not so simple. Uh, right. it's, it's already very difficult to understand what the consumer wants from a food perspective in North America. Um, and so we need to make sure that our local teams are close to the consumer and they feel that they are empowered to do what is necessary, move fast, do new things, connect to the consumer in new ways. And to make sure that they feel that, we, we change the organization structure we change the processes in the, in the company, and we also change the incentive uh, structure. Um, and we, we want to make sure that they are rewarded for taking risk and, and, and doing new things. And, and you talked before about you know, the fact that you've been on a you know, cost-cutting mission for a long time. You know, it's no secret that 3G, you know, the, uh, the uh, Brazilian-run uh, fund that, that has taken over Kraft Heinz and, and others, you know, has really focused on cutting costs, and you've made the point that you can't grow your way uh, by cutting, yeah. Yes, I, I think every company these days needs to run its business in the most cost-efficient way possible. Don't get me wrong. Right. But at the, sa at the same time, that is not a purpose of a company. The purpose of a company is to grow, to connect to its consumers, to connect mm -hmm. to its clients, and, and do new things. And so you, you want to find a balance between the two. Right. And my point was really to say, you can't save yourself to prosper prosperity. In the end, food is changing. We want to play a big role in that, and th that's what we need to achieve. You know, so, I, can yeah, I pile please. on that for yeah. a second? Because you know, one of our issues right now is we do have to cut costs. But the way we look at it is we have to cut the costs that are non-value added, which, you know, like if, if you uh, live in a house and you have a closet, eventually it's going to be filled up. If you don't clean it out, you're not going to have any more room. And getting rid of non-value added processes and, and you know, mm. different tasks over time, we don't stop and do. And motivating people to eliminate costs so they can, it can be reinvested back into technology and growth is the way to approach it, right? So I, I think you have to keep, you know, as you said, people diligent on never wasting a penny, 
because every penny wasted is something you're not going to be able to plow back into growth. So your industry has a 3G challenge. You've got a 5G challenge, um, you know, yeah. in the telecom industry. Um, you know, a lot of this, a lot of the, the way we're going to structure the telecom, you, you know, your company is changing. You're going from a, a pure distribution and data company to more of a content thing as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think that um, the, the comments these folks just made, uh, I would resonate. We, motivation is an important part of cultural change. Mm -hmm. and, and when you have an existential threat that, that is defined externally, then you have um, the benefit of motivation. We're on our fifth death sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, we were on the cover of The Economist as you know, the death of distance. Yep. And then wireless was going to get rid of the wireline business. And then um, the IP revolution was going to move everything off circuits into packets. Right. And then uh, when we launched the iPhone jointly with Apple, we made the decision to let the operating system be the dialer and the Right. The text message and all those things were supposed to kill us, and now the the, the cord shaving, cord cutting, television moving to software is the next yeah. death sentence. So, so motivation is a key part of it, and then you have to rearchitect. And so we we talk in terms of rearchitect, and cost comes out, but the cost comes out because all the costs are normally things related to customer friction you don't want mm -hmm. or a legacy architecture that you want to shed to get yourself into this new world. So for us, the move to the next generation of network, 5G, that's, the, that's a, a drumbeat for our industry, but for our company, it's a heartbeat. And that's mm -hmm. what we like to talk about is, this is where, when you get a, the, a new battleground, mm -hmm. this is when a, a, a company kind of gears itself up and says, this is motivating. And so the combination of those three things, which is, defined existential threat um, externally, a re-architecting internally in a brand new network mm -hmm. puts us into magical times if, if you're inside the company. So what looks like challenge is actually really described internally as opportunity. So I'd read somewhere, um, and correct me if this is the wrong stat, but since 2007 with the iPhone, your data usage went up 250,000%. Right. So imagine, imagine that being the tra traffic across, <laughs> right. you know, a, a bridge or something, and the infrastructure. It's not easy to catch up, but yeah, that's about right. That's that's extraordinary. So, so what is? I mean, so what is five G going to do to, to this? It's a network that, in in lay terms, is going to be real time, and so you look at it, and unlike you know a traditional network leapfrog, where you say it's faster, mm -hmm. and therefore I can download things faster. That's not this world. It's the difference between magic leap being a goggled headset and something that looks like glasses mm -hmm. because a lot of that compute is in the network. It means autonomous cars can do things very differently. Um, it means that you can get location down to the millimeters. So you can start to have striping on roads done by machines and all of those sorts of things. So this is about the industrial side of the internet taking a big leap forward. It will have consumer benefits, but this is going to be uh, I think, magical times for, for enterprise. So I want to go to some questions in just a minute. So if you've got some uh, questions, uh, just identify yourself and we'll get a paddle to you. Uh, but before I do that, earlier uh, this afternoon, um, Aaron Levy was describing, a, a box was describing digitization. And I, I had always thought, you know, this is going to be, you know, the, the revolution is going to be AI and robotics and, you know, blockchain and all these things. And he said, no, it's really about getting closer to your customer. And I imagine that the three of you might have some perspective on how you're doing that. Um, yeah, for, for us, it means uh, two big things uh, with our customer. One is, um, I call it more digitalization than digitization because it's right. about how to, to really use digital in anything you do. Um, it, it allows us at a large scale listen to our uh, consumers. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of social li listening or machine learning where we listen to uh, millions of consumers at the same time. And that helps us to much better understand in, in which moment do they use our products, what's important in our products, how do we innovate, how do we communicate, 
These days we will have we will run a hundred different commercials for Oreo online, depending mm -hmm. on what your online behavior is, and we know what type of personality you are. That's kind but of those creepy. things, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's, it's it's what you post uh, no, publicly, basically. So, uh, <laughs> um, but it's it's uh, it's it it allows us to connect much better with our consumers. All right, and that's really what. Uh, Let's exciting. get a question. Um, Phil, I guess. Yep. Phil Waba with uh, Fortune. So this question is for Catherine. Um, one of your competitors, Avis Budget, um, is talking a lot about getting all his cars connected by 2020. And I just wanted your thoughts on, uh, is Hertz doing something similar? Does it see the need to do it? And perhaps more broadly, with, with all the, uh, you know, your landscape changing, how do you make sure you're spending your money uh, the right way on, on new tech? Well, when you look at connected cars, um, the business model around it actually that makes it self-funding is, um, you know, the information now that we get on the car. You know, from, you know, at any given time, we have to, in, in order to make money, 82% of, of the time we have a car, it has to be on the road being driven by somebody. And so we have a greater ability to know where that car is, how soon it's going to be coming back and dropped off, and hence, you know, how, and if somebody's using their AT&T yeah. phone, um, that they're there and somebody else is ready to get that car and make that match and come together at the right time. But things like knowing the brakes, the, t um, the, the wear and tear on tires, um, right now on fuel, we round up. Um, and give people the benefit of the doubt, well, we'll be able to tell exactly how much fuel was used. Um, so there's savings there. If somebody crashes the car or dents the car, um, now this is, may not be so consumer friendly, but at the end of the day, we have to repair that car. We'll know that it, it needs to be repaired. Um, in general, you know, having the connected car has more benefits to consumers than not, because what if you drove away in that car, didn't notice the dent, and we tried to charge somebody else for it. So in general, all that information um, provides a better experience. Um, you can also come anytime to one of our sites and rent a car by just using your phone. Um, we call it touchless rental. So like a Avis is talking about, we actually have three different uh, programs out there for what we, what's telematics, which has been around for 15, 20 years, um, been in most of your cars like OnStar for GM. Mm -hmm. um, and we're moving forward with you know, testing what we think is going to have the best technical capabilities going forward. And we do think it is going to be a connected world, and we will have all our cars connected. Connected cars have made, uh, given me a new perspective on traffic. Mm -hmm. I now sit and think of those things as the cash register ringing. So, uh, right, I, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> so all of that, that data that you're all collecting, and Dirk, you talked about the fact that you're using it to target some commercials or advertising uh, in a very targeted way toward the consumer's desires. You're collecting a lot of information and using it, you hope, to drive content for, for people. Yeah, but I, I think that um, if you look at the the highest and best use of our data is to take friction out of your customer relationship. Mm -hmm. And some of that can manifest as a lighter ad load, mm -hmm. which is, I think, one of the things you're talking about. If we're going to transform content, people, if you're in the market for something, um, a, a two-minute ad load in what you're interested in and in the market for is not a bad experience. Mm -hmm. Eight minutes of what you're not in the market for is, is a different story. But I do think the, the way we think about the highest and best use of our data is to get the friction out of the system and make sure customers aren't frustrated because you don't know about them for the like the last time mm -hmm. um, that I rented a car. I really want Hertz to know that and to invest that in the next time mm -hmm. so that all of those things don't need to be either re-entered or dealt with at the counter. So I think of it as take all the data that's going to make that the minimum amount of friction. Mm -hmm. um, and that's true of everybody who supplies us. And that's how we, we really want to look at it is mm -hmm. we want our people to be our differentiator. And the best way to do that is have the people solve the tough problems that are not repeatable and take the customer frustration down with the things that are. You know, mm -hmm. what, it, it's amazing how interconnected all technology has become. Because we can't do the touchless rental that we do with our phones if we didn't have the phones. And, with, and that's here and now. Um, with 5G in the future, um, you can't do all the things that they're talking about from an autonomy and connected car 
perspective adequately and safely without mm. a 5G capability. So they're, they're all connected. And you can't leave a rental car without your Oreo wrappers on the ground either. Oh, yeah, you can. And okay. you do. You need a hiding place. For, <laughs> yeah. you, you actually need a hiding place. <laughs> hiding That's place. one thing the cars need is the Oreo wrapper hiding place. So we just have a couple of minutes left in this extraordinary day about reinvention. Um, and we've had, or we've had two fantastic uh, uh, conversations, a day's worth of conversation about this. Um, I'd love, I, I know our audience would love it if, if, you, if they got some words of advice for from you, um, experienced CEOs, on what how they should think about reinvention in just a half a sentence. Um, you want to start? Yeah, one left to right or right to left? Um, wh wh what do you prefer, Dirk? Okay, Dirk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, about reinvention, um, I, I think it's about understanding th what's the future, what's the vision. Mm -hmm. and uh, making sure that everybody in the company gets excited about that. Mm -hmm. Kathy, should I, make, should I make John go? No, uh, <laughs> we'll go in order. Um, you know, I, I think reinvention is about constantly questioning, are you relevant as a leader? Um, and are you keeping your company relevant? Um, mm -hmm. And if you are constantly focused on that, it, it forces you to reinvent yourself, reinvent how you go about leading, and reinvent your company. Mm. That's great. I don't think an army can hold back um, a technology whose time has come. And I think that you have to not only, you know, it's, it's cliche to say disrupt yourself. You have to design yourself out of business because if you're not, someone else will, and then just manage the pace of that change. John, Kathy, Dirk, thank you very much. Thank and you. thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.